the lightsaber is here. Yep. <laughs> that is the lightsaber. That's exactly the one that uh, Obi-Wan Kenobi brings out of the trunk and gives to Luke and says, this was your father's, and which plays a huge prominent role in the new film. So could you describe, I can't believe I'm here with the lightsaber. Can you describe it uh, for the people listening? Yeah, it was, um, it, it, we literally had no money to make Star Wars. This is what no one quite understands. It was a $4 million budget and I had no money to build sets or to build props or anything. So I was using found objects. And because I was deeply uh, embedded in mythology as well as George, I knew this was the Excalibur of the cinema age so I knew I had to find something special and I dug around I couldn't find anything this prop people made some George rejected the special effects they rejected and one day I was um, I made Luke's binoculars with super glue and a couple of bits of old camera and I needed some lenses to stick on the front I went to a photography shop where we got all our equipment from mm -hmm. and um I asked him there, I said, have you got anything here buried away that I might look at? And he said, well, look under the shelf there. I brought out an old dusty box that hadn't been opened for about 10 years. And the music was in slow motion. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, out of this box, I found these Graflex flash handles. I just took one in my hand and thought, there it is, there it is. And I raced to my office back at EMI Studios, stuck the same T-strip that I put around the Stormtrooper's gun mm -hmm. for a handle. I'd broken down some calculators, found this bubble strip here that magnified the numbers, stuck that in. I stuck chrome tape around it to disguise it and called George and said, you better come and have a look at this because I knew that was his kind of real iconic um, image for the film. And he just held it in his hand and smiled. And that from George is the biggest accolade you can get. And we added a D-ring on the back here, which because um, George needed to hang it on his belt in the desert. And that's exactly, I made two or three of these, and they're the ones that came out of the trunk in Obi-Wan's uh, cave that he gave to Luke. What was it about um, that object that you saw that you connected immediately to the mythology that, was, that, that was, you've been steeped in uh, and made you feel like this uh, has the weight, it has the... Um it, it just the look of it, you know, and it even had the red button on here, like a firing button. And it had these things on it that I could never have come up with as a design. And Ralph Laurie's painting, Ralph Macquarie's painting had a kind of handle in it, but you couldn't really see clearly what it was. I just knew when I had it in my hand, this was it. it it's a beautiful object and it's heavy. You talked about how people, uh, I'm, I'm scared to touch it, by the way. I want to <laughs> hold it, but I, I, I'm scared to. Um, you mentioned at the outset there that people don't really realize that this was a $4 million budget on the original Star Wars film. That's what we had to start with, yeah. And a lot of people didn't believe in this film. Most, no. I, I was lucky. I, was, I met George. We were on Lucky Lady in Mexico, and George came down because the same writers wrote that. And when George was given $4 million by Fox, if he could make the film for that, we were British, and the UK head of Fox said, we can make the film in England for $4 million. So... <laughs> <clears throat> we were in a tiny studios for four months with George, John Barry, the designer, myself and Les Dilly. That was it, in a tiny studio for four months, trying to work out how in the hell to make this thing. And, um, you know, my mantra had been, which was exactly what George kept saying, was science fiction before that never connected to audiences because it looked new and shiny. And I thought it should be down and dirty and real. And that's what George wanted. So... Um, you connected on that point right away. Immediately in Mexico. That was our first conversation when I was dressing an old salt factory and he came down and met me and we spoke about exactly that. I said, to me, science fiction should be like an old car that's been repaired many times and it's dripping oil. He said, that's my film. That's what I want. Tell me about uh, R2-D2, the construction of R2-D2, because that was a challenge as well, especially for the actor inside it. Yeah, we knew that during that first four months, the first thing we ever made was a wooden mock-up of R2-D2 because um, we knew without R2-D2 and C-3PO, George didn't have a movie because they were the storytellers. He took them from Forbidden Fortress, a Kurosawa movie, the squabbling peasants. And uh, we found Kenny Baker and he was the only one who was three foot eight with very strong legs. We knew he could work this and uh, so... I had Monty Python's prop maker I hired 
to make him. We literally, they couldn't even give us any money to make it. Bill had um, plywood at home, which was for boats. So he, we built a wooden mock-up. I couldn't, he said, I can't put a top on this, Roger. I can't afford it. So I found an old lamp round the back and we bought it for 10 shillings. I stuck that on. I got some aeroplane nozzles. They're all still there today. And his little arms on the front, Bill said to me, I can't do that, Roger. So I carved it myself with a pen knife at home at night. I mean, that was R2-D2. And eventually we got him to walk because um, I found an old um, uh, fighter pilot's harness because he could not make it move. And we had to. And I, we put that inside and he wore R2-D2 like a rucksack. Wow. And stumbled along. And George looked at it and said, yeah, it's going to work. I think um, it sums it up. And we, we made a land speeder as well out of wheelbarrow wheels and plywood. And Gary Kurtz's wife came down one day and she said, wow, this sure ain't Hollywood, is it? So you have these incredible challenges because of the budget. You're working with so many found objects and, and just making do. When did you get the sense that this thing is really coming together, that you're really realizing your vision? Right from the beginning. I knew, and I, the first thing I ever made after with R2-D2 was the Stormtrooper's gun, and I, I took a Sterling submachine gun, stuck this T-strip round it, put a gun sights on the top, and then I made Han Solo's weapon, which I found a beautiful Mauser. I knew this was what George wanted, like a space western. Yeah. Called George over to look, and... Uh, Again, he just smiled. He stayed with me and we made Princess Leia's gun. And I knew then I had something in my hands. These were first time real weapons. And uh, and I think the moment that I finished dressing the Millennium Falcon cockpit and the hold where the chess game is, those were my gamble because I couldn't afford to dress the sets in a normal way and build them. So I bought miles and tons of airplane junk <laughs> and we broke it down, and this was a win. I heard it was I'd... very cheap to buy that airplane junk. That's yeah, it was why. nothing. No one wanted it. Airplanes, it's very light metal, so it, they sold it by weight, so no one wanted it. I could buy a huge amount for 50 pounds, so I bought trailer loads, and um, when I'd broken it all down and stuck it on the sets, I didn't know it would work. Again, it was a, a, a new thing for me, <laughs> but when I saw those two sets, I knew then... I, I've heard that Alec, Alec Guinness rolling in the dirt was also a good indicator that this project was coming together. Yeah, that I think was one of the... I was there and um, Sir Alec Guinness was coming. Of course, all the actors, they were pretty new, were in awe of this, you know, this giant actor coming from Britain. And he came, he was in front on the first take he ever did. He had his costume on in the desert. It's where Obi-Wan meets Luke. And uh, Alec kind of turned around and just rolled in the dirt. And to me, that broke, for George, it broke that mystique thing that Alec was coming with the other actors. And they realized if this great actor who's, you know, a stage presence in Britain and everything would do that, that's a mark of respect. Mm, respect and, for the project. Yeah. And in case you're just tuning in, I'm Shad. You're listening to Q. And I'm speaking with Academy Award winning set director Roger Christian, the man behind many of Star Wars' most iconic creations. Roger, what was it like to see these creations on screen for the first time? It was, um, I went in the Dominion Theatre, they had a screening for the cast and crew, and the moment that ship came overhead, the cinema lit up. The buzz in this place was amazing. Everyone out, went out high as kites after seeing this film, and... Uh, even though I'd slaved for a, almost a year without a day off and very tough film to make. I, I stood by Georgie's side when a crew didn't believe it, nothing. I forgot it all. I just watched mm. a piece of cinema magic come in front of me. I got the same last night too, I have to say. <laughs> what did you think of the new film? It's amazing. Yeah. It's so reverential. And JJ, he's a master. Um, he's brought back what George has brought to the world in such a reverential way and such an exciting way. I can't tell you, this is reigniting this whole 
Star Wars kind of saga for a new new generation now. What did JJ understand that he's brought to this film? Again, without spoilers, but the, I feel like there's you're getting at an essential element. The uh, mythology. Uh, yeah. So George is a great mythologist, and um, the, the, why I've always supported these films full length is because we need fairy stories and legends in our lives. They teach us, you know, this moment when Luke chooses his destiny. That's King Arthur pulls a sword, Excalibur out of the rock, the great Mabaratas. Every country has their own legends <clears throat> buried in those are keys that help us man or woman george is the one well joseph campbell told him that he was the only true living myth maker working today and that's true and i think jj's joined him on the mountain <laughs> why do you think that is do you think that's for lack of people's lack of trying or do you think just few people have that gift I think few people have that gift. Um, I think that um, Joseph Campbell spent his life studying mythology and explained there's only really one story and there's keys within those stories. And if you get those keys right, like King Arthur and Excalibur is huge in our history of every nation in the world, um, they connect into our deep, subconscious without you realizing it and George's genius was to make this ride like a Saturday morning cinema but underneath is buried keys you know when Luke is given the choice looking at the twin sons he's either going to take destiny by the hand and go or he's going to stay a farm boy we all have those moments do you remember a moment like that for you yeah um I do I mean that you know some moments early on some um but in a way, when I we had a lunch in um, in a way, Star Wars did it for me. We had lunch in in a, a famous restaurant um, in Los Angeles with John Barry, and he said, "George has offered you the film to set decorate if you want to do it. Just be in London on the thirteenth. And and that moment to me, I'll never forget. You could feel the importance. Yeah, I could. I just knew, and I hadn't read anything. I didn't know anything. I knew George, and I knew THX, and I knew those things but that moment yeah sure it it's it's uh it's it's a moment that counts and and at the end of lucky lady i was almost dying of paratyphoid in a hospital in Weimar. so several of us working in terrible heat wow. and there was a moment for some reason there was a, a poster of scotland on the wall i don't know why in this strange sleepy little fishing village in mexico and that moment I decided I was not going to end my days there. I was going to go back. And in fact, I had to analyze, when I made Black Angel, which was a short film that George commissioned for Empire Strikes Back, when I analyzed that story, I realized it came from that moment because it was a knight fighting death. Unbelievable. Yeah, so these things matter. When did you start to believe in story? in that way and believe in the power of story. Is that something that started when you were younger or was, was it that experience? No, Mexico? I was young. Yeah. I mean, I, I go back, you know, and I, I, I mean, growing up right after the war, my father was in the war, never had contact with us. And uh, I think I got through by reading King Arthur, Ivanhoe, Thomas the Tank Engine books were amazing to me. And I read all of these fairy stories and they ignited in me something that, I felt I belonged to this world, not to the world I was living in, that I could not understand where I was. And I, I, I think I was fairly isolated and shy at that time, and mm. uh, they got me through. So that's, mm. what I, that's why I'm so supportive of George, now JJ and, and Star Wars, because he's brought that back to an audience that is now more used to cartoons and animation and seeing stuff. He's brought that back. Did you feel that um, kinship in terms of the hero's journey with the people you were working on the original Star Wars with those core people? No, <laughs> no, because except for John Barry, the designer who I adored, you know, and John died very young and on, when he was second unit director on um, Empire Strikes Back. John understood he was a huge help to George. I remember when I was directing second unit on Phantom Menace, um, George one day stopped, we were walking across the big stage and he looked at me and he said, I really miss John Barry. And um, it was a very heartfelt moment for him because John and I really stood by George's side. Um, and he told 
the producer that there were only five of us really who were with him on it and uh, we were like students together and I, I think we were in a way battling the rest of these disbelievers mm. um, to get this thing made. There's a lot of stories. I've written them all now. I, it, I, they push me and push me to write a book, so I've done it. It's coming out this April. Uh, it'll release called Cinema Alchemist, and that's all the stories of making Star Wars and Alien. Wow. What does it feel like? You grew up with these incredible stories. What does it feel like to be a part of one now? It's kind of surreal because, um, you know, you... you you know, I have always had the kind of British stoic attitude. That's how I was brought up within a country that was stoic at the time. And we got on and did things. You didn't take much notice of emotions and all of these things. You just dug your way in and got on. And um, I kind of knew this was special. Um, and my son, my older son, Thomas, now, he says to me, and he was working on Phantom Menace with him, he said, you don't understand. He said, you worked on Star Wars Alien and Life of Brian. People are constantly coming to me <laughs> and saying, your dad was on these three things. And to me, it was kind of work that I was part of. But um, I'm very proud of it, I have to say. As, as you should be. Thank you so much, uh, Roger. Not at all. Thanks. That was set decorator, writer, producer, director, and Academy Award winner Roger Christian. He's a person who designed the original Star Wars lightsaber that is in Studio Q right now and created sets, props, and even R2-D2 for the first Star Wars film. That is it for Q today. Tomorrow, Melanie Jolie, Canada's new heritage minister, will be with us. Q at cbc.ca is a place to send us your feedback, and you can stream Dwayne Betts' Q playlist at cbc.ca slash Q. I'm Shad. Thanks so much for listening.